Mark your calendars, September 1st. We will be having a Friends and Family Day. That's the first Sunday of September. And, and we will have a Friends and Family Day in which we will have the lessons to be evangelistic. And we will have this card that you can use to invite your friends and your family. And it's not marked at the bottom, the uh, date and the time, because the ones that are left over we will use for another friends and family time. So you can mark in it September 1st at 9.30 a.m. That's when we start on Sunday morning. And therefore, people will uh, be invited. You can invite uh, your friends, your family, your enemies, perhaps your family that's enemies. You can invite everybody, your neighbors, co-workers, classmates. Invite them to come out and hear the Word of God. This is an evangelistic effort for us to reach people uh, with the gospel. So there will be some of these next to the uh, box there, which is next to the door. Also, to let everyone know, in September, probably mid-September, the house-to-house, heart-to-heart mailing in Roy City will take place. There's about 1,300 houses that are going to be uh, receiving that magazine, house-to-house, heart-to-heart. It has some good information in it inviting people to come and uh, worship with us. So there are some great efforts that are being made to evangelize uh, our community, evangelize those who are around you, and these are just some of the tools and some of the ways that we can do that. In Exodus chapter uh, 3, you have God calling Moses from the burning bush. And, of course, no one knows exactly what that looked like. This uh, kind of cartoon representation here is uh, something that kind of helps give us a visual aid to get a concept of what that burning bush may have been like. We do know it was a bush. It was burning, but it was not being consumed by the fire. It was a miracle taking place because it was a manifestation of God's presence. And from that burning bush, God called Moses to remove the sandals from off his feet for the place where he was standing was holy ground. And he identified himself as the God of Moses' ancestors. Verse 6 of Exodus 3, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. There's many great lessons of reverence and respect and hallowing God and having a fear of God that we are supposed to have as we approach God, approach His Word, and worship and serve Him. Now, we know through chapter 3 and chapter 4 how that uh, Moses was being called to deliver God's people out of Egyptian bondage. And we know that Moses gave excuse after excuse after excuse as to why uh, he was not going to do this. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to get somebody else to do that. And at one point, God got angry with him and says, Your brother Aaron, he can speak. You use him as a mouthpiece. You'll be God to him. He'll be your prophet. So God eliminates all excuses when he wants us to serve him. There's really no valid excuse to not serve God and to do his will. God eliminates them all. And so we see God speaking to Moses and saying, Moses, I want you to do this. But we have something interesting in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4, verses 21 through 26. In this context of Scripture, after Moses goes to uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, and says he's going to go to Egypt and go, uh, to go to Pharaoh and speak to him concerning releasing the children of Israel, in Exodus 4, 21 through 26, God sought to kill Moses. God sought to kill him. It's a very interesting context. Because Moses was lacking something. And therefore, even though God had called him at the burning bush, 
because Moses was lacking, because of his neglect, God was seeking to kill him. Look at verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all the wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And when you study the rest of the book of Exodus, and you study the rest of the Bible, you find out that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was because he, through his own free will, resisted the message of God, let my people go. Therefore, God, through that message, hardened Pharaoh's heart. Verse 22, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Talking about the nation of Israel that was in Egyptian slavery. They are my son, son, my firstborn. Firstborn meant a place of prominence and preeminence within a family. Verse 23, So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Israel is my firstborn. Let them go. If you don't, I will kill your firstborn. So it's already being announced what the final plague is going to be if he refuses. God means business. God means business when he says, this is what you need to do. But not only for Pharaoh, but also for Moses, God means business. Look at verse 24. When it came to pass on the way at the encampment, the Lord met him and sought to kill him. The Lord was going to kill Moses. Why? Well, we get an understanding of it in the next few verses. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, cast it at Moses' feet, and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood to me because of the circumcision. Hundreds of years earlier, in Genesis chapter 17, God made a covenant, a circumcision with Abraham. Said the boys were to be at eight days old circumcised. All of them are to be circumcised. This is a covenant with your, between me and you. And the ones that are not circumcised, they are to be cut off. Cut off means to be executed. If you did not honor God's request, a command to be circumcised according to the covenant that God was making, He says you're to be cut off. And cut off in the Old Testament meant to be executed. So God here is not showing any favoritism. He tells Uh, tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, if you don't let my firstborn go, Israel, I will kill your firstborn. Then he sees that Moses hadn't complied with the covenant of circumcision. So he's going to kill Moses. The one that was going to be the great deliverer of Israel. Why? Even in the Old Testament, God showed no favoritism. Because Moses, through neglect, or whatever reason, did not have his son circumcised according to the covenant made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. And Zipporah did not understand it. And therefore, when the circumcision took place, said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. And then says it again in verse 26. She did not understand it, but she did it anyway. And you can tell by her outrage, this was something that she did not really respect, but knew it had to be done. Now, look at verse 26. So he let him go. Well, I don't know the manner in which God was about to kill Moses. I don't know if he had something on him. I don't know if he had something physically on him. I don't know if there was some illness upon him. I don't know the nature of this 
But he had him and was going to kill him. Then Zipporah went ahead with the circumcision ritual. And then God let Moses go. We understand from this that God means business when it comes to his will. If it's talking to a pagan king like Pharaoh or Moses, the one that would be called by God personally from the burning bush to be the deliverer of Israel, we must comply with his will. Let's learn a few things from this uh, text of Scripture. First of all, everyone must comply with God's commands. Everyone. It doesn't matter who they are. Whether it's the President of the United States or the person on the street. They must comply with the conditions of salvation. They must have faith in Jesus Christ confess Him as the Son of God, repent of all their sins, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. And, according to New Testament teaching, they must all worship the same way. They must worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23 and 24. Uh, The president can have his own worship, and then the man on the street have his own worship. Because when they obey the one gospel, they're placed into the one church and they have to worship the same way. Everyone must comply with God's command. Whether God is commanding Pharaoh, let my people go, or I will kill your firstborn. Or the command made hundreds of years earlier to Abraham, you circumcise your son on the eighth day. And if you don't do that, you'll be cut off. Well, God was about to cut off Moses. And if God cut off Moses, you know what? He would have got someone else to deliver Israel out of Egyptian bondage. You see, we can either work with God's plan, be a part of the providence, be a part of God's scheme of things, or we can resist it and pay the consequences. Number two, not everyone will be supportive when we obey. Did you notice Zipporah's reaction? She didn't like that one bit. But if she wanted her husband to survive this, she needed to go and do it. And she did it. But she was not supportive of it. You know, when we obey the will of God, there's, there might be times when people that are very near and dear to us don't understand it. They don't get it. They don't understand why we do what we do why we don't do what we don't do you know peter talks about that in first peter chapter four it says they they speak evil of you they 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 think it's strange that you don't do the same things they do and they speak evil of you you know peter talks about that in second peter chapter two where he talks about the way of truth will be evil spoken of these false teachers will speak evil of the way of truth. The church, uh, the plan of salvation, the correct way to worship, they'll speak evil of that. They'll make fun of that. Well, that's one indicator that they're a false teacher if they're going to do that. And sometimes those are the people that are nearest to us. Zipporah, his wife, did not understand, did not honor circumcision, but was going to do it because she knew, seemed like, that Moses was going to die. And she went ahead and and did it. Not everyone will be supportive when we obey God's will. There are many stories of people who had to choose between their family and Christ. They had to obey the gospel and be rejected by their family. In some places in the world, it's so severe that you're, you're disinherited. In fact, some will even seek your life if you obey the gospel in Islamic countries. Your life will be on the line if you turn your back on Islam and you obey Jesus. Not everyone will be supportive when we obey. And number three, leaders must lead by example. What good would it do if Moses goes up before Pharaoh and he says, you need to obey the voice of Yahweh, the one true God, but 
uh, Moses, you didn't. You didn't. Your son's not been circumcised. Your son has not complied. You had not caused your son to comply with the instructions of circumcision, that sign of the covenant that was made to Abraham. And so that would have been something that would be very hypocritical of Moses to go before Pharaoh saying, you must obey the voice of the Lord when Moses himself had not obeyed. Leaders must be example. Of course, we have the ultimate example in Jesus Christ, the perfect leader. We've looked at Moses today, both this morning and tonight. We've, we've seen that he has flaws. He, he, he made some mistakes. He did some things that were incorrect and had to correct those things. Uh, he was a great man, did wonderful things. However, he was imperfect. Jesus is the perfect example. The great perfect shepherd of the sheep. And therefore, when we look at his life and we try to make practical application of his example in our life, we have a perfect example to follow. But then you look around at others who are leaders. They are to be followed as far as they follow Christ. What did Paul say? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. As long as I'm imitating Christ, Paul says, you imitate me. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Leaders have to be a people who lead by example. That's why it's very important that men who be elders, who would be elders, are qualified. They meet the qualifications that are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, there are to be examples to the flock. If they're not faithful to the Lord, and it's widely known that they're not faithful to the Lord, how can they shepherd the church as they should? Preachers are to be examples. Preachers have no authority in and of themselves except by the Word of God. But they're to be examples. First and Second Timothy and Titus tells the preachers to be examples. They're to practice what they preach. So leaders must lead by example. Moses going before the children of Israel as he would do in Exodus chapter 4. And he would show those signs that God would work through him. Verse 31 says, So the people believed, and when they heard the Lord had visited the children of Israel, <clears throat> that he, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that he has looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and they worshipped. But what if Moses would have went to them not having honored the very basic Jewish thing of circumcision? He wouldn't have any credibility before them. No credibility at all. And by the way, God was going to make sure that wasn't going to happen because God was going to kill him. He wasn't going to let Moses go up before the people as an unqualified man to lead and deliver the nation of Israel when he himself had not complied with the important covenant that God made in circumcision. So, God would have done away with Moses and would have raised up someone else. So we learn these wonderful lessons from this not very well-known section of Scripture. I don't think I've ever seen this depicted in a movie or a TV special about the life of Moses. you got the burning bush, you have everything else, but you don't have this section depicted. And this is something that is very, very important. Because if Moses had not had this happen to him, if Zipporah had not gone through with this, we may not be talking about Moses today. We might be talking about someone else who delivered the children of Israel. Everyone must comply with God's commands. Have you done that? Not everyone will be supportive when you obey. You have to keep that in mind. You're obeying God. If people don't like it, they have to come to an understanding that this is God's will. And if they still don't like it, that's just too bad. You're obeying God's will. And that's what ultimately matters. And if we're going to lead, we must lead by examples. We must be practicing what we're trying to get others to do. Believe in Christ, confess Him as the Son of God, repent of your sins, 
and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and the Lord will add you to the church. If you've done that and you've gone astray, we urge you to repent. Come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and while we sing.